Uh, we've been talking about the inverse trig functions, and I had a little bit more to say about that, and then we'll go on to something a little different. So what we have so far, specifically talking about the um, derivatives of these, just the last thing I want to do is talk about the integrals. Now, uh, just to refresh our memory, let's say the derivatives of these. So these ones, this is the derivative of the inverse sine. And the derivative of the inverse cosine is almost the same. It's just a minus of the same stuff. And we talked about that last time. This is somewhat strange but true fact that the inverse sine and inverse cosine are, are actually kind of the same function. They're just um, one is negated and then shifted upwards to become the other one. Uh, and then uh, the tangent, the arc tangent. I meant to point out for the sake of our visitors. Did you notice I say please on the quiz? This is the true Fairfield University experience. Yeah. Um, very courteous. <laughs> I still give you an F if you do it wrong, but at least I said please. <laughs> All right, that's the uh, inverse tangent derivative that we talked about at the very end last time. Okay, so what does this all mean about integrals? Well, first of all, actually, it doesn't mean anything about, for instance, the integral of inverse sine. That's actually something that we're not going to talk about. As far as I know, there isn't a nice formula for that. Um, but it does mean if the derivative of this one equals this one, then that means the integral of this one equals this one. So that's what we get sort of for free. So I'll say uh, we get the integral 1 over root 1 minus x squared dx equals inverse sine of x plus c. All right. So as far as integral formulas goes, this is a fairly... Um, fairly obscure one. Like it's not every day that you find yourself wanting to do the integral of 1 over root 1 minus x squared. But if, if you see this for some reason, the integral of that is the inverse sine. Now on a typical like list of formulas, we don't even really do this one. So to write this one backwards would say the integral of this is the inverse cosine. But this as a function is just the same as that without the minus sign. So this is true, and also it's true that the, in, the integral of that is also equal to negative cosine inverse of x. But uh, as far as integral formulas goes, typically this is the one that you'll see written down. The other one is, is sort of redundant or just uh, not, not useful in light of that first one. And then the tangent one, though, this really is different. So this says integral 1 over x squared dx equals inverse tan x plus c. So these are formulas to remember about the inverse integrals involving the inverse trig functions. They are integrals where the inverse trig function is the answer. Uh, integral with the inverse trig function inside the integral is, uh, there are not nice formulas for that. All right, so for example, just to use like the second one, I kind of like the second one better just because it doesn't have that square root in it. How about integral of zero to one? One over one plus x squared dx. All right, well, I just used the formula. The antiderivative of that stuff is uh, arctangent, or inverse tan of x. <laughs> and I have to plug in 1 and 0. Not much to it for just to do that integral. Uh, to plug in 1, I go tan inverse of 1 minus tan inverse of 0. And then what are those? Uh, this, I suppose you could do on your calculator, but these ones actually you can do uh, kind of by hand. Remember what tan, <coughs> inverse tan of 1 means. It means is the, uh, the theta with tan theta equals 1, right? And any, any tan experts out there? Is it pi over 4? I believe it is pi over 4, yeah. If I were trying to figure this out, tan theta equals 1. To, to me, I, I like to draw myself a little triangle. And if the tan is 1, that's the opposite over the adjacent. That would be like a 1 and a 1 here. That's a triangle which, which has tangent equal 1. And now I can recognize that that's a 45 degree triangle. So the angle is uh, pi over 4, right? Or 45 degrees if you prefer. But you know me. I'm not into rate uh, degrees. 
I'm a Radiance man myself. All right, and then uh, the other one, arc, uh, inverse tangent of zero. What's the angle whose tangent is zero? Anybody? Yeah? Isn't it just zero? It is zero, yeah. The tan of zero is zero. So the inverse tan of zero is zero. Yeah, great. So the answer is pi over four. All right. Excellent. Anybody out there still on the fence about degrees and radians? I don't know, some, there may be some radians haters out there. Uh, but I would suggest that this example actually is a decent uh, reason why to be a radians lover, not a radians hater. Um, why am I a radians lover? I don't know if you've ever thought about this for yourself, but one of the reasons is this this is the answer, like the air, this uh, left-hand side represents the area under the curve, right? The area under the curve of one over one plus x squared from zero to one. You could draw a graph of that and actually like show, show me on your piece of paper what that area is. It is pi over four. This, this is a number <laughs> less than one, right? Now if, you, if you're a radiance hater and you said the answer is 45, that's a, that's a very different answer, right? I mean, this area, whatever it is, pi over 4 is not the same as 45. If you think, if you really think the area is 45, like square inches or whatever, it, that's just straight up wrong. Um, why is it wrong? It's because, actually, these formulas only work if you're using radians. If you're using degrees, the, then you have to do something like multiply by 180 over pi or something like that to, uh, to convert it. So, um, a lot of the formulas that you already know and love from calculus really only, they are only true if you're using radians. Like for example, this formula, which everybody loves, the derivative of sine is cosine. This is only true with radians. It's, it's not true with degrees. You, there are ways to compensate for that with degrees, but um, the formula is not true because this represents the slope of something. And there's a big difference between the slope of something um, in degrees or radians. <coughs> anyway, let's uh, let's continue then. I hope we're all radians lovers here. You don't have to love it, but degrees just straight up give you wrong answers if you use the the formulas that are written in typical boxes. All right, uh, in the um, I I have just a couple more examples using these two formulas in the boxes here. Of course, usually we're not going to just plug into the formula and leave it at that. Usually you have to do some, some amount of work to sort of make the formula apply. What about if it were like this? Did I put the, I put the squared in there before, right? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so this is what I want to do. This almost looks like the formula. I will just refresh our memory. The formula is the same, but without the four. So the big question is, how are we going to make this uh, fit the format appropriate to use the formula, right? Really, we need to somehow deal with this four here. Anybody have a suggestion? Yeah? This is a good idea. You, the idea is, I think, well, this is basically the same as that, only instead of the x here, it's like a 4x. So maybe I'm just going to get inverse sine of 4x. This is a good idea. It's not, the details are not quite with it. You got more specific? Uh, 2x altogether squared is 4x. Yeah, yeah. So the first thing to notice is if you really want this 4x to be playing the role of x, actually it should be a 2x because this x over here is squared. So the appropriate way to make this sort of match up exactly would be like that. So it's really where you might have thought it was 4x, it's really 2x. There's one other slight uh, issue and that is you cannot just at this point, you can't just, okay, now I'm going to use the formula here and plug it in. Actually you're not allowed to just straight up plug into this formula with a 2x instead of a x here. Um, you'll, get, you'll get bad results. Any ideas? There's one more sort of little trick we have to do. Yeah. Something about the chain rule. Yes. There's going to be an extra 2 or an extra 1 half or something like that when you do this. Um, Any have, have a specific way of working this out? I was going to say something a little. Yeah, you should do a substitution at this point. 
which is basically the same as a chain rule uh, in reverse. But um, I would do at this point u equals 2x, right? <coughs> and the result of this will be it's going to say in this position 1 over root 1 minus u squared. And then I'll use the formula directly with the u. All right, but this is the idea. So u equals 2x, then du is 2dx. And I am going to have to do a little business with an extra 1 half here. 1 half du equals dx. So when I do the substitution, it becomes integral 1 over square root 1 minus u squared. And then dx, instead of dx, it's 1 half du. 1 half du. All right, going to take the 1 half out. And now the thing inside there is exactly the right format to use the formula in the box. You just, it's a matter of moving stuff around and usually you have to do a substitution to make it match exactly. So the integral part of this is just inverse sine of u. With a one half. And then uh, last step would be to replace the original variable of x, so it says 1 half inverse sine 2x. There you go. All right. Any thoughts about that one? So sometimes you got to move things around a little bit to make it fit the uh, formula in the box. All right. Sometimes people say that like the language they would use, this, this makes me slightly uncomfortable. They say, we need to massage this first to get it to match the uh, formula in the box. I don't really like that. All right, great. Let's just try one more of these sort of, uh, this one you have to massage a little more. You gotta really work it uh, a little bit. 16 plus x squared dx, all right? So when you see that, of course, what should come to your mind is somehow I'm going to use this, this formula in the box. It's just a matter of figuring out how exactly do I need to rearrange stuff to make that happen. And this one, I don't know, to me this one seems a little worse just because you can't use a u substitution just like replace place one with 16 or something like that. It don't work that way. Any, anyone have an idea? You can do something a little a little clever. Yeah? This might be wrong. Could you multiply by 16? So that you can cancel out the numerator and denominator? Multiply by 16. Yes. What I was going to say, which I think is, is a slightly easier way of saying the same idea. How about we factor 16 out of the denominator? So it's going to say 1 over 16, and then here, 1 plus x squared over 16. That's the trick, all right? The reason that this doesn't match the formula the way you want is because this 16, you want it to be a 1 instead. And the way to make that happen is not by a substitution, but by just moving the constant around to force this to be a 1. Now, I fixed up the 16 and made it a 1, but I messed up this part. How do, uh, can we handle this messed up this part here? We can do that with the same u substitution thing that we did last time. So this is a preliminary step to make that other constant become a 1. Of course, you can take the 116 all the way out. And then this business, we're going to do like we did in the previous example. First, I want to sort of absorb this into the squares. So what will it say inside? Something squared. Yeah. Yeah, x over 4 squared. We sort of got lucky that 16 is the square of a number, but it doesn't really matter. If it were, say, 15 instead, you would write x over root 15, which is kind of annoying, but it would still work. dx. All right, and now we do the same kind of substitution from the previous example. So I'm going to go u equals x over 4. du is 1 fourth dx, and then Divide the 1 fourth over, which is the same as multiplied by 4. So this is 4 du equals dx. And we should be able to work this out. So 1 16th out front, integral, it now says 1 over 1 plus u squared, which I like a lot. And then dx is 4 du. Factor the 4 all the way out of the integral. It's going to be 4 over 16, also known as 1 fourth in the front. 
integral 1 over 1 plus u squared du. <coughs> and then this we can use the formula in the box is inverse tan. So this is 1 fourth arctan of u plus c. And then finally we put the x back in. These are all just routine steps to finish it off here. There we go. One fourth arctan of x over four. Let's see. Any thoughts or questions about that one? Great. Uh, you might notice actually this. Um, you know this business about. There's a sixteen here, right? Um, you might wonder, well, what if it wasn't 16? What if the number was something else? Like, if it was 9, what would the difference be? Uh, it, everything would be more or less the same. Can anybody say? Maybe you can just, like, predict for me. What if this number instead was 9? What would the answer look like? What's the difference? Yeah? All the 4s would be 3s. Yeah, all the 4s would be 3s. Basically, whatever that number is, well... I, can I just say, generally speaking, and it's, it's not hard to actually work through all the stuff, leaving the original thing as a constant. If you, gen in general, have it like this, rather than being 4 squared or 3 squared or whatever, I mean, it doesn't really matter, just whatever number that is squared, what it works out to in the end is that number a is what appears right here. Since it was an a squared here, that's playing the role of 16, and the result would be just the a, which was for 1 over a arctan x over a plus c. Sometimes you will see formulas like this written in, uh, in textbooks. I'm not, I will not expect you to remember that version. This is a more fancy version of the one that with, with a equals 1. This is, what, this is what they call a generalization. When a is 1, you get that other formula, but this one allows you to do more stuff with it. And then I will just say, similarly, for inverse sine of x, there is a similar fancy version of the inverse sine uh, one, which I'm going to let you all check out on the homework. Uh, it's not so hard to work out the details on your own. All right. And this, I believe, is the uh, all I wanted to say left over about in inverse trig functions. Anybody have any thoughts or questions about that? The inverse trig functions in radians. All right, great. Uh, let's go on to the next section then. That was the end, I think, of chapter six in the book. I'm thinking. This, this next section may also be in chapter 6, but I think probably not. So the, chapter 6 was all about inverses, inverse functions. So there was one section just about inverse functions abstractly, and then there was the logs and the expo uh, exponentials, and then this uh, inverse trig functions. All right, let's get on with something completely different then. So this is something that you may have seen in high school, maybe not. Um, it is just about the derivative. Uh, it's kind of cute in my opinion, this thing, indeterminate forms. And there is a rule associated with indeterminate forms. That says forms, so it's hard to read. And L'Hopital's rule. Everybody loves L'Hopital's rule in my experience. L'Hopital's rule is a trick for, uh, it's a trick involving derivatives. Actually, this material in this section has nothing to do with the integral. It's all about derivatives. But um, indeterminate forms and L'Hopital's rule. All right, uh, let's talk about sort of what this is all about. This is for um, computing limits. where plugging the values in, plugging in results in 0 over 0, All right? Uh, we haven't done much of this just because we, we haven't really talked much about limits by themselves in this class. But as you know, if I ask you to find the limit of a function, of the limit as x approaches 3 or whatever, 
this standard approach is just you try to plug three into the function and see what you get. And if you get a, a legitimate answer, then that is the answer of the limit. Uh, weird things, though, can happen when you uh, pl try to plug your numbers in and you get zero over zero. I hope that you remember from your uh, first, uh, you know, your single, whatever, calc one, um, that uh, when you get zero over zero, this actually doesn't tell us anything about the limit. This doesn't say anything about the limit. In particular, zero over zero does not mean that the limit equals zero. Um, you might be tempted to cancel the zeros in the fraction and say, isn't that one? The answer is no. Uh, it does not mean that the answer is one. It doesn't mean that the limit does not exist. This doesn't say anything about the limit. It could be anything. Or it could not exist. There's an old movie called uh, Mean Girls in which the limit does not exist. It was a big sort of like emotional punchline at the end of the film. Yeah. And actually, the, if you look at the, the, the problem she was working on, um, that is a problem where you use the L'Hopital's rule. So she didn't say it. She didn't say, oh, I'm just I'm going to use the L'Hopital's rule here. The limit does not exist. That would have ruined the moment. But that's what she was doing in her head. And the L'Hopital's rule is a really sort of cute trick that, um, that you can kind of do in your head in some situations. Um, so, and it is about what to do if you get zero over zero. And here is the basic trick. This is called L'Hopital's rule. And I'm gonna try to describe why this is true, but uh, for now, we'll just try some examples first. L'Hopital's rule, it says, um, if uh, when you try to plug the values in, so if we're doing L'Hopital's rule applies only to a fraction. So it's, it's a rather specific situation, but actually this comes up a lot, so it turns out to be pretty useful. If we're doing the limit as x approaches something or other of, I'll say f of x divided by g of x, and of course, what everybody does when you're trying to do a limit like that is just tr you try to plug the value in. But the problem is, if we're doing this limit and f of a equals 0 and g of a equals 0, this is a, a fancier way of just saying when you try to plug it in, you get 0 both times. All right? And this is, uh, this is bad news for, every, for you as a calculus student because you don't know what the limit is. But anyway, here's what the L'Hopital's rule says. Then this limit, the same thing again, f of x over g of x is actually equal to the limit x approaches a of f prime of x over g prime of x. So the limit of a fraction, if you get 0 over 0, then the limit of that fraction is the same as the limit of the fraction of the derivatives. There are primes on the right-hand side there. All right, this is a weird fact, weird but true, and actually quite useful when finding limits of fractions like this, and even limits of some other things that don't, don't naturally appear as fractions. All right, so for example, let's just try a few simple ones. And then I, I, will, I do want to talk a little bit about why, why you should believe that. Um, uh, how about this? This is just like a standard example that you might encounter in a calculus class. All right. So if you're doing this limit in, a, in your first, uh, you know, baby's first calculus class, you would begin by trying to plug the value in. So I would try to plug in. Now it's not going to work, but um, just let's just pretend we don't know where this is all going. I would get 1 squared plus 2 times 1 minus 3 divided by 1 squared minus 3 times 1 plus 2. This is 1 plus 2 minus 3 over 1 minus 3 plus 2. That's 0 over 0, all right, which is bad news 
What would you do in this case if you if you don't? So one thing you can do is L'Hopital's rule. But what if you if you don't know the L'Hopital's rule? Anybody remember how you would figure this limit out? Yeah. We try to like factor it. Yeah, I would say go back to the beginning and factor. And this in this case it's not so hard. This one factors as x plus one x. Sorry, x plus three x minus one. Right, and the bottom factors as x minus one, x minus two, and then you can cancel these guys, and then you can try to plug into that. I would get one plus three over one minus two, which is four over negative one, negative four. So actually, you can do this one by going back and factoring first, and then plugging the value in. But what if I told you there was an easier way? There is an easier way. So this is the, the hard way. And this is how you learn to do it uh, at first. Um, why didn't they tell you the easier way to begin with? I think it's because just because of the way that people learn calculus. When you first learned about this, you didn't know what the derivative was at that time. So there, it wasn't possible for them to tell you how to do L'Hopital's rule. But uh, now that we know L'Hopital's rule, that was the hard way. But this is the L'Hopital. It would say. Taking this limit, x squared plus 2x minus 3 over x squared minus 3x plus 2 is the same as the <laughs> same limit of the derivatives. So this is equal to lim x goes to 1 of the derivatives. I take the derivative on the top. I also take the derivative on the bottom. All right. Any quotient rule lovers out there take offense at this? This is a little weird to take the derivative on the top of the fraction and also just take the derivative on the bottom. Of course, the derivative of this fraction as a whole, you would have to use the quotient rule. But this is a special weird thing about L'Hopital's rule. It involves taking the derivative on the top and also on the bottom. But anyway, this is a true fact using the uh, L'Hopital's rule. And then we can just do this uh, by plugging in again. So this now would be. 2 times 1 plus 2 over 2 times 1 minus 3, which is 4 over negative 1, negative 4. All right? So we got the right answer by doing this weird thing where you take the derivative on the top and on the bottom. And this, I hope you agree, is, is easier. I mean, the, it wasn't that hard. What I call the hard way is not all that hard. But you don't have to do any factoring here. Uh, you just get the answer by taking those derivatives. All right? Great. Now, in that particular example, uh, of course, we didn't need this L'Hopital's rule because we could have factored instead. But oftentimes, this is the only way to do it. So often, we need the L'Hopital's rule, L-hop. Um, like, for example, this one, limit as x goes to 0 sine of x over x. Maybe you remember, uh, this is like a weird one where um, you know, you can't just figure this out by plugging the value in because when you plug the x in, I try to plug it in, I get sine of 0 over 0, which is 0 over 0. And so that's my uh, 0 over 0, which is a signal, which means either you should go back and factor, but that's not an option here because it's not, these aren't polynomials, uh, or you should go back and use L'Hopital's rule. So that's what we're going to do. Sine x over x. We take the derivative on the top and on the bottom. And you should write the lim again here, because you are then going to take the, uh, take the limit again. Uh, the derivative of sine x is cosine x, of course. And on the bottom, the derivative of x is 1. And now I plug the value in. I get cosine 0 over 1. There's nothing to plug into on the bottom. But that's uh, What's cosine of 0? Show me the fingers. 1. 1 finger. Yes. Great. So the L'Hopital's rule, it really uh, works great. Uh, you've probably seen this limit before, right? To actually figure out this limit, um, not using this L'Hopital's <laughs> rule is, is quite complicated. Um, you have to go through a, a weird sort of triangles argument to, uh, to explain what that limit is. But it's one in any case. All right. Excellent. So these ones that we have been discussing uh, are all of the form 0 over 0. So this thing, 0 over 0, is called 
an indeterminate form, as I said before. Indeterminate form. Indeterminate means uh, the idea behind that word is like when you look at that thing, zero divided by zero, this doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't signify any specific number. It certainly doesn't mean zero and it doesn't mean one. All right. There are other indeterminate forms in, in uh, mathematics too. Um, similar things work with infinity over infinity. I don't know if anyone, uh, if you ever wondered what is, uh, what is infinity over infinity? Is that like cancel out and give you one? Um, or is it just infinity straight up? Or is it zero? Maybe you think it's zero because um, infinity denominator should make that thing uh, zero. Uh, it's none of those things. This is also called an indeterminate form uh, of sort of uh, of uh, infinity over infinity. All right, and uh, you can use L'Hopital's rule in that setting too. You can use the L'Hopital's rule there also. Uh, this generally you will encounter if you're doing well. This uh, this comes up when you're doing limits involving x going to infinity. All right. For example, this limit as x goes to infinity of e to the x over x. Now the plugging in step is a little different here because you, you don't really plug in infinity, or you don't, at least like you shouldn't say that in public. Uh, of course, infinity is not a number, so you can't plug in infinity. But you still want to think about what happens up top and on the bottom if I'm going to make the x go to infinity. So this. Um, I will say, like, when x approaches infinity, this looks like, well, certainly it looks like uh, infinity on the bottom, right? Because that's x. It used to be x on the bottom if x is going to infinity. And what about e to the x? When x goes to infinity, does that become, like, zero, or does it become also infinite? Or you have to think a little bit about the, the graph of e to the x, maybe? Yeah, I think that also becomes infinite. If you're doing e to some super big power, of course, the answer is an, another super big number. So this generally looks like something like infinity over infinity. All right. And so we can use the L'Hopital's rule. <coughs> it says lim x goes to infinity, e to the x over x. What the rule says is I can take the derivative on the top and also the derivative on the bottom, and the limit will be the same. Uh, 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 uh. So taking the derivative on top, e to the x gives me e to the x again, and then the derivative on the bottom, x becomes a 1. So this is just the same as lim x goes to infinity of e to the x. And what is that limit? Yeah, this is infinity. e to the x uh, becomes infinite when x goes to infinity. All right? Great. I don't know if this is an unsatisfying answer to get infinity as the answer, but it's certainly better than infinity over infinity, which doesn't even mean anything. This, this at least uh, has some, that, that is the answer. You can't do any better than that. All right. Excellent. Uh, so maybe I'm going to write like the, the official sort of formal statement of the L'Hopital's rule, and then I want to try to talk briefly about why you should think this is true. In my opinion, it's just kind of a weird, uh, a weird fact there's not to me there's not like an obvious reason why you should feel like that's true but anyway I'm gonna write this like a theorem and we're not gonna do we're not gonna really do the proof but I want to try and give you some idea so the theorem says if we have a function on the top and a function on the bottom now those functions they need to be differentiable Remember, that means they're continuous and they have derivatives at every point. That just means that f prime and g prime actually exist. Because if, if the derivatives don't even exist, then certainly you can't do L'Hopital's rule. So if these are differentiable and f of, uh, sorry, I'm going to say it this way. Lim x goes to a, f of a equals the lim x goes to a, g of I meant f of x, sorry. 
g of x equals zero. So that means if you are trying to do the limit on the top and the bottom, you get zero both times. This is the setup for the L'Hopital's rule. Or L'Hopital's rule can also be used when it's infinity over infinity. So it's uh, if those limits are both zero or those limits are both infinite, so I'm going to say or if the limit as x goes to a f of x equals either plus or minus infinity, it doesn't matter. And the other one also is infinite. G of x is also plus or minus infinity. Then the conclusion, so if all of that business says if you begin by getting zero over zero or infinity over infinity or minus infinity over infinity, or whatever, then the conclusion is lim x goes to a f of x over g of x equals lim x goes to a f prime of x over g prime of x. This is sort of the formula version of the L'Hopital's rule. All right, the limit of a fraction is the same as the limit of its derivatives. This only works if you get the zero over zero or the infinity over infinity. All right. Uh, I want to try and give some vague idea why you should believe that, and then we're just going to do a bunch more examples, and that should do us for today. So here's a vague proof. Um, and I would like to think about, so we're going to start with, uh, actually, in, as, as maybe you've seen before, sometimes when you're trying to argue why this is true, you know, traditionally I would just start with the thing on the left and somehow explain why it's the same as the thing on the right. Actually, it's a little easier to start with the more complicated one in this case. So if I start with this, lim x goes to a, f prime of x over g prime of x. And just this once, I'm going to um, replace, instead of f prime, I'm going to write this in terms of the definition of the derivative. Now, um, hopefully you, you at least remember a little bit about the definition of the derivative. Usually it's written as something like f, f prime of x, I would write as lim h goes to 0, x plus a, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. But there's another way to write it, um, maybe, and I hope that you've seen this before. Instead of f prime of um, yeah, instead of that, that, that one with the h, there's also one where you have sort of uh, two values of x which are coming closer together. This is also, this is like the other version of the definition of the derivative. I hope that's a little familiar to folks. We're, we're basically never going to talk about this again, so it's, it's all right if, uh, if you don't remember that. But um, this is using, sorry, I need g's down here, using the definition of the derivative but the, the other version of the definition of the derivative. Uh, it's the same idea, though. Instead of x plus h uh, becoming the same as x when the h goes to 0, here we have just x and a becoming the same when you do the limit x goes to a. But anyway, can we simplify here at all? <coughs> yeah? You can move the x of a up to the f of x and then bring the other one down. Yeah, the x minus a and the x minus a, you could sort of flip them all around. And I think eventually they will just cancel, right? Yeah. We have the numerator and the denominator are both divided by x minus a. Those can go away. So this is the same as f of x minus f of a divided by g of x minus g of a, right? Uh, OK, we are almost. Remember, I'm trying to demonstrate this thing in the box, right? I started on with this one and did some stuff. And here we have this limit, f of x divided by g of x, uh, minus these guys. It turns out, though, that these guys are basically 0. And that's because we assumed this fact, which I haven't used yet, that these guys, when you actually try to use a in these two functions, you get 0 both times, which means these guys are actually 0. So this and this are both 0 since we get you know, 0 over 0 when we plug in. 
but what, is, what do I mean plug in? Plug in means you actually put A into the function and you put A into the uh, function on the bottom. And, and what we are assuming from the beginning that we actually get zero both times for those. So that means that this equals, those two things that I circled there are both zero. So all you get is this. And they are the same, this and this, all right? Unfortunately, I don't have like a, uh, a more like down to earth intuitive reason why you should think that this is true. I would say like if, um, if somebody, you know, if I'm talking about this in a social situation, the club for instance, uh, if someone asked me like, why is that L'Hopital thing really true? I would say, well, it's, it's basically because of how the definition of the derivative works. Uh, that if you take this derivative on the top, that's really the same as one of these values with a weird denominator, but the weird denominators cancel both times. So the, these derivatives here are kind of the same as, um, or the, the ratio of these derivatives is the same as the ratio of the values of the function. It's not very easy to explain in a, uh, in a neat and tidy way, but it is true and quite useful. All right, we got a little more than 10 minutes. Let's just try a bunch of examples here. Mm -mm -mm -mm. How about, uh, how about, can we, uh, can I give you guys some to do? I think we have enough time. I have four examples here, which I would like for us to try. One of them is kind of a trick question, but I'll leave that for you to discover. Limit as x goes to one, ln x over x minus one. Limit as x goes to zero cosine x minus 1 over x. I got four of them, like I said. <coughs> Lim x goes to 2. x squared minus 3x plus 2 over x squared plus 2x plus 1. And all right, see what you think. Feel free to chat with your friends about it, as always. Let's take eight minutes, which will leave five minutes to talk about the answers. Is that true? Something like that. Four minutes to talk about the answers. say one of them is a trick question. I'll let you determine which one. Kind of a trick.
Right, that's what it's not. Okay. Clear to action. Clear to action. Clear to action. Clear to action. No. You can, I would suggest rewriting this and give it some other work. Because that's really, this may be the last one itself is a <coughs> All right, can we try these? We got a few minutes. Um, the uh, natural log of x over x minus one. So you should first try to plug in the numbers. You get ln one <coughs> over one minus one, which is zero over zero. And that means that you are allowed to use L'Hopital's rule. So I go back to the beginning here and I take the derivative on the top and on the bottom. Now you should still be writing lim here. One just one on the bottom, right? This is the limit as x goes to one of one over x divided by one. And now you try to do the limit again. It just got simpler, so hopefully I won't get zero over zero this time. And you won't, when you plug in one here, you just get one, a lot of ones, right? One over one over one, which is one. So I hope that's what you said for the first one. All right, this one here, cosine x minus one over x. Again, I try, I begin by plugging in the number and seeing what happens. This becomes one minus one over zero, which is zero over zero. That means I can use L'Hopital's rule. So starting back from the beginning, this becomes lim x goes to zero. Somebody uh, say, what'd you get after doing your derivatives here? This is You're in the you're in the the other problem. Oh, sorry. I'm doing. <laughs> yes, negative sine x over one, right? Yeah. And then we plug the value in to take this limit. It becomes negative sine zero over one, which is zero over one, which is zero. Excellent. All right. The next one. The next one is the trick question. Although as I was walking around, nobody fell for it. Um, what you should do is. Try to plug this value in and make sure that you get zero over zero. See, the trick for this one is, since this was in a big list of L'Hopital rule problems, 
You might have just immediately started doing the L'Hopital's rule. You'll get the wrong answer in this case, though, because the L'Hopital's rule only applies if you get 0 over 0. And in this one, you don't. Uh, if I try to plug in, I get 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 2 over 2 squared plus 2 times 2 plus 1. So this is 4 minus uh, 6 plus 2 over 4 plus 4 plus 1. That is 0 over 9. So actually, in this one, you cannot use L'Hopital's rule, which you, maybe is a bummer, but it's not, it's not really a bummer, what, uh, because you can just say what the answer is at this point. right? There's no need to do L'Hopital's rule because you get an answer to begin with. The limit is 0, and that's really all there is to it. Uh, so if you get 0 on top but not the bottom, then the limit equals 0. What do you say? <coughs> what if you say if you get 0 on the bottom but not the top? Yeah, then the limit does not exist, or you, sometimes you could say the limit is infinity or negative infinity, but for me, I'll, I'll just say it does not exist in such cases. All right, and then finally, the last one. I suppose this is maybe the, the most complicated one. Again, I will start by trying to plug the value in. I get cosine 0 minus 1 over root 0. That is 1 minus 1 over 0, which is 0 over 0. So we should use L'Hopital's rule. What we get derivative of cosine is negative sine the minus one goes away and on the bottom root x becomes one half x to the minus one half and now it's a good idea to try to simplify here before you know eventually I'm gonna plug zero in but uh, negative power in the denominator actually translates to just x uh, to that that same power but but positive so this is the same as minus sine x times one half x to the one half, right? A negative exponent, which is already in the denominator, is the same as a positive exponent. And now, can you do this limit? It's not a fraction anymore, but each part of this you can plug zero into. This part becomes negative sine of zero, and then this part becomes negative, not plus, times. Uh, one half times zero to the one half. All of that is zero. Right. There you go. I think that'll do it. I hope you all had a good weekend. Have a good weekend.